Okay, continuing with our program today, uh, we're going to start a session in which we will be talking about best practices. And uh, I'm, I'm very, very happy to moderate this session, especially after hear, hearing the previous uh, speakers talking about the access programs we have around the world. And because, also because me as a GIS patient, I have been always surprised and amazed by the great work uh, patients and patient organization do around, around the world, especially, especially advocating for access. And uh, we're gonna have four, four guests today. Today, the, the three of them, all of them, five guests, sorry. All of them are, have a great history. I'm gonna make a really short introduction not to take their time for them presenting. And uh, we also will have questions after they, they finish. Um, our first uh, guest is Sarah McGoran. She's a patient, a GIS patient from Australia. And she will share with us an amazing story of strength and perseverance. And uh, I want to uh, also uh, thank her for being here at this time for her is really late. So thank you very much, Sarah, for being here and for sharing with us your, your story. I leave you with your audience. <laughs> Wonderful, thank you. I'll just um, share my uh, screen here. I've got a few slides up as as well. Is that um, can you see that clearly there? Yes. F fantastic. That's great. Well, thank you so much for such a lovely introduction, and I'm really honoured to um, be presenting today um, and talking about. Um, uh, better access for uh, GIST patients um, in Australia and my experience as well with that. So I guess just to start a, um, as a bit of an introduction of um, me and my story. Um, so I live in Canberra, Australia. Uh, I'm 43 years old um, and I've just celebrated the milestone of living with GIST for 25 years. So at 18 years old, I was diagnosed with um, pediatric wild type GIST, which we now know as SDHB positive. Um, and it was really lovely to hear um, Dr. Dimitri speaking yesterday um, and talking about his um, the 2001 Gleevec trial, which I, um, I was a member of in, um, uh, joined in, in Australia in 2001. So I'd been diagnosed five years earlier and had um, over 50 lesions in my small bowel, which with no treatment or surgical options. So that was my very first treatment option, which um, incredibly grateful for. Uh, and actually, I um, from 2003 to 2005, I actually was lucky enough to live in Washington, D.C. Um, and was treated at Washington Hospital Center as as well as in Boston um, under the care of uh, Dr. Dimitri at Dena Farba. Um, and then since then, I've been uh, living in Australia and, um, and Professor Desmond Yip and uh, David Goldstein have been um, taking care of my, um, my GIST journey. Um, so in my personal experiences, so I've, uh, as many other patients have shared as well, is um, surgery, um, many surgeries and Gleevec, um, Sutant and then uh, Stivaga, um, Regorafenib that I've been on since 2015. So I've been on that for um, six years and that's still stopping the uh, progression of my disease, which, uh, which is a good day. Um, um, I guess un unfortunately for patients in Australia, um, Gleevec and Sutant are the only funded treatments uh, available for those subsidized or reimbursed by the government. So they cost $50 each, um, each month, um, but all other treatments such as regrafenib um, cost about 10,000 or more per year, oh, sorry, per, per month for patients. Um, and it was when my disease progressed on Sutant um, that um, uh, I sort of really understood the limitations and it was actually the beginning of my patient advocacy journey for myself. Um, and it started as a desperate need to get access to my next treatment and, and grew into a broader um, eagerness for change for everyone in Australia with GIST to try and improve our future treatment options. 
Um, so that, that was really the beginning of my um, really active uh, advocacy in Australia. So just to give you a bit of an understanding of the Australian system, and I can see some similarities with, um, with Korea as well, that we have a uh, universal um, health insurance scheme, um, and it guarantees all Australians uh, access to a wide range of um, health and hospital services at low or no cost. And it's a wonderful scheme for many and most. Um, for example, two weeks ago, my son broke his leg playing basketball um, and ended up in hospital and he had surgery um, and rehab and all of those complicated things you do as a parent. Um, and so there was zero cost involved with that. Um, so wonderful system for that. And I treated the Canberra Region Cancer Centre, uh, which is a public system. So I um, see my oncologist and have pathology done and there's zero cost to me. So all patients across Australia have access to an oncologist at no out of pocket cost. So, so that's a wonderful element of our system. The challenge for GIST patients in um, Australia is, isn't so much accessing hospital care, but it's accessing funded treatment for GIST. So rare and less common cancer treatments um, struggle to meet the approval criteria set by the government, um, which then as a result, we then have only have Gleevec and Sutans that, um, that have been approved, which, which makes treating GIST um, quite limiting particularly when you have that progression. So as a advocate, um, um, I guess I'd start with our achievement um, and our achievement this year um, was uh, as, as a group of patients was um, a very exciting moment. Um, we managed to advocate um, for Kinlock to get funded by the Australian government and listed on the pharmaceutical benefits scheme. Um, this was really surprising for a few reasons. Um, just drug therapies and a large number of rare cancer drugs struggle to meet the criteria for funding approval. Um, and Stivago, Regrafenib, um, has failed twice to get funded and is still not funded. And I'd actually written patient submissions um, on two occasions when they were put up for uh, funding approval in 2014 and 18. And they both failed, failed to get funded, um, which is a real challenge. Just those limited criteria where they need large amounts of data, which as a, as a rare or less common cancer, just by definition, we're rare, so the data isn't there. So it, it just makes it very difficult to uh, reach that criteria. So as a patient group, I guess we had a very clear challenge. Um, our challenge was how to persuade the government to fund Kinlock, which is, is, a, is a big task. Um, and in March this year, Kinlock had been declined for funding or reimbursement um, to subsidize the cost for just patients. The pharmaceutical company had been given an offer of resubmission um, in July, which was going to be our very last chance. Um, and as a as a GIST patient, and there were so many of us, um, watching the treatments fail that approval process is just absolutely devastating. Um, and I'd gone through the process with Regrafenib and um, I just couldn't bear for that to happen again. So um, I knew that as a patient group, we really had to rally to give it a chance for Kinlock to get approved. Now we had 10 weeks to come up with a plan and run a campaign before it was at the final moment um, of the gov government's decision. So the strategy that we, um, that we used, which was initially understand the approval process. So at that point, we reached out to local experts who knew the unique Australian um, challenges that we had. So I reached out to a group, Rare Cancers Australia, who knew the ins and outs of the Australian approval system and also worked with a lot of patients that, um, uh, that require treatment that aren't funded through uh, the, the government system. Um, and then it was a matter of identifying the roadblock. So why had it failed? Um, and cost, uh, which is almost always the case, was number one. 
uh, we knew as a group of patients, we couldn't influence that. That's that there's a there's a global market at play. So cost was going to be a difficult one for us to adjust. But the second element was within the committee, we had um, had the understanding that there was a limited number of patient submissions to the committee. So they, um, which was highlighting the potential benefit of Kinlock on patients and their quality of life and longevity of life, which was a criteria that could allow them to approve the, um, uh, uh, fund the drug. So from that, we knew that we had to gather patient stories, highlighting the patient, the human impact of Kinlock and mobilize the patient group to raise awareness and build a little bit of momentum and, and pressure around, around the issue. So mobilizing the GIST community, and you can see on this slide, these are just some of the amazing GIST patients in Australia that um, put in patient submissions and were part of this process. It's definitely not all, it's just only a few. Um, and you know, this was a really important step. So it was uniting and mobilizing this group. Um, and so the way that I, I guess I started this, and this is not about me or my involvement, this is about a community that's been together for quite some time. Um, I guess I just, you know, reached out at the beginning. And um, so I, I reached out to the patients that I knew and the GIST community Facebook groups that were already well established and explained the challenges that we faced with the Kinlock approval. And many were unaware of the process and the inequities uh, within the system, as I had been when I was on Gleevec and Sutent, um, I was really unaware of, um, of, where, of, of how the process went. So, so what I did is I, I shared my own personal story and I reached out to the individual patients and asked them if they'd be interested in sharing their own story and write a submission for the committee. Um, it was important at this time as well that there, there were a lot of people that, um, well, there were some people that just weren't comfortable writing down where they were at um, or sharing their story um, to then submit to a, uh, the committee, which was absolutely fine. Um, and they actually helped in other ways. They, would, they were happy to share my story more broadly within the networks, which was still really, really positive. Um, we're also built on um, existing networks, people's individual and personal Facebook and um, personal networks, and then the just patient groups and other advocacy groups as well. And we just celebrate the unique stories. And I tell you what, not surprising, but the uh, GIST community really stepped up. Uh, across the group, we had over 30 patients who shared their deeply personal stories about how important an another line of treatment would mean to them and their families. Um, it, they're absolutely incredible. Um, we submitted over 15,000 words of the most heartfelt stories to the committee. Um, with these photos as well. Um, and then, so during this process as well, we um, made sure that all the patients were supported and connected them with, uh, with local uh, support groups as well, just to kind of support them throughout this process. Um, then the next step was to keep everyone up to date and keep them, bringing them along the process as well, which was really important because we were needing them um, to stay energized for the entire 10 weeks and just jump in and help when they could. Um, so that, that was the element of mobilizing the GIST community. And then the other element was um, harnessing the, the strength in um, networks of existing organizations. Um, so I'm a, a primary school teacher, so I have no experience with government, with medicine, um, beyond as, as a patient. Um, all with media. So um, I had a lot of learning to do to understand how the system worked. And so I just tapped into as many people as I, organizations as I could to try and understand the process. So in groups, obviously, Life Raft Group, you know, the international experts on GIST. Um, I think we had a 1 a.m. phone call um, many months ago where you were just amazing at just help, helping me understand um, the importance of Kinlock and the community. Um, Rare Cancers Australia, who were the, the, the local group that could support people, um, the patients in our time zone, and they had a really strong understanding of, of the way the system worked. I also reached out to specialised therapeutics who 
um, hold the license uh, for Kinlock in our region um, and just tried to understand what their sticking points were for the funding approval. Um, and then the Department of Health who managed the committee, um, GI Cancer Institute who are affiliated with the AGITG, who the trial group that actually funded all the way back the 2001 Gleevec trial. So they've been around for a long time. Um, just to tap into their knowledge, understanding and networks as well, which was really, really powerful and, and made a significant difference. So the next point was amplifying the patient voices. We had all these people who, all these wonderful patient, just the just community who um, everyone was passionate but didn't know what they could do or how they could do it. Um, and so we just had a social media campaign using Facebook and a range of different networks and reach as far as we could. Um, LinkedIn to connect with people in the industry um, media and a few journalists as well and patient advocacy, advocacy groups. So they were, um, that was really powerful as well. Um, traditional media of TV, radio um, and newspaper. Um, and what I found interesting is that the small local print media at first I thought was just perhaps not so influential, but what was really valuable is it was a really important building block to then, which eventually led to national coverage for us. Um, so just getting in the, the, the local free magazine then led to three or four bigger opportunities um, and just helped build the credibility as well, especially when the organizations um, that I had on the previous screen started sharing those articles that really helped build momentum and made a really significant difference. Um, and understanding the decision makers constituency. Now that one's um, uh, interesting. So I, towards the end of the campaign, I ended up with a uh, radio interview um, with a fairly influential Sydney talkback radio station that was listened to by some um, significant, uh, it had a really significant audience. Um, and so all the previous media had built up to that one moment um, and that also led to a lot of other media opportunities as well. So they really do just build on top of each other, which is really, really powerful. Um, while that was happening, we're also in parallel lobbying the decision makers. Um, so within the group, I put together a, a call to action. Um, so anyone that felt resilient enough and eager enough um, had a job and it could be as simple as um, guided steps of you know share this post or can you write a letter to your local member um, or can you make a phone call to your federal uh, um, member of parliament uh, and it, it was really successful it was just fabulous so as a group we um, contacted 20 federal members of parliament and some of them multiple times. I think one said that he was completely inundated. So we was calling to try and slow it down. Um, uh, met face to face with 10 of the members of parliament. Um, and then as a, um, as a part of that as well, I got a meeting with the federal opposition health minister as well. So as a group, we actually covered all of the Australian states, four of the political parties, the two major parties, two minor parties, and also um, connected with local, state and federal politicians. And with each of those moments as well, we then uh, created posts in social media, which then the group shared, and it just built its own momentum in the most wonderfully positive way. So then, as a result, in August this year, it was announced the committee would recommend funding for Kinlock, um, which was just amazing. It was the most joyful day being able to call all of the patients who had put, you know, put their, their hearts on paper and submitted it through to the, um, the committee. Um, and so there were lots of wonderful tears. And, and so now, um, uh, Australia has Gleevec, Sutton and Kinlock. A as of last Friday, uh, the early access program opened for Kinlock and one of the patients who wrote a submission started taking the medication. So it's happening now and it's making a difference to people right now. Um, so I guess what changed between March where it was declined and August when um, it, was, it was funded? 
So there was a slight change in the economics, um, but the significant um, elements uh, was compelling human impact from just patients. And so that was the patients sharing um, the importance of this approval to the committee, to the community and sharing it across the media and networks as well. Um, and we also had significant outreach to members of parliament um, and, and right across the media as well. Um, and a, another wonderful result was that the GIST community was strengthened as a result of the campaign. Um, so friendships were made, um, connections were made, there's more support for each other, the conversations were just fabulous in supporting each other. Um, and um, you know, it then puts us in a great position if future advocacy uh, is required. So that is a really fast track version of um, our campaign with Kinlock. Um, and, you know, uh, if anyone has any further questions, feel free to reach out to me at any time um, or throw questions in the chat. But um, yeah, uh, after so many years of challenging um, and, you know, seeing drugs, uh, fail. It's it's been a great few months where we have another treatment for uh, GIS patients in Australia. So thank you. Bravo! Thank you very much, Sara, for sharing your story. It's really inspiring for all of us. And I I can I would say two words that I think that are quite important in this. The first one, putting a face to a problem, and so that it's not just we don't have access, but this is the person who does not have access. I think that that is just amazing. And the second one, the importance of collaboration. I mean, the patients, the stakeholders, the family, I mean, the, the, the great things that you can do when you collaborate among, among them. So congratulations again, this was amazing. And I'm sure many of us will reach you to know more about how you did it because it's a huge example for all of us. So thank, oh, you, thank you very, very much. You're very kind. Thank you. Happy to help. And it's, you know, really lovely to share. Okay. Thank you very much, Sarah. Thank you. And our second guest is someone who is very special for me. And I'm very proud and happy to introduce her. She is Senator Carolina Goich from Chile. And she has, through his career, well, she has an amazing career, but through her eight years as deputy and eight years as a senator, she has always been together with patients in which she has done an amazing work in mean, a lot of achievement, but uh, she has always been there with the cancer patients and advocacy groups fighting not only for, for them, for us to have access to the treatments we need, but also fighting for to have a, a very a fair and quality health system in, in our country. And she was the, the big, a heart of, of the uh, national cancer law. And it's thanks to her that we, we have it here. So I don't wanna say anymore, she will, she will, I will leave you with her. So uh, Senator, your audience is for you. Thank you very much, Piga, for that presentation. Also for inviting me uh, to this seminar. Um, I just want to say that I am improving my English, so I apologize if I have some mistakes. I'm going to do my best effort, but uh, it's really an honor for me to be here, and especially with Piga. She's a great friend uh, for many years working together in cancer, and I'm, I gone, I'm going to share with you our experience with the most important law for me, uh, my lovely law, I can say, uh, the, the cancer law, and how we work with patients for that. I'm going to share my screen. So, um, I want to um, tell you how collaboration with patients, organizations, um, let us improve access to cancer treatments, especially in our cancer and um, national cancer law. First, uh, some preliminary considerations about public participation. First, uh, the importance of promoting uh, civil society organizations to strengthen democracy. It's not just uh, because we have to participate and to speak to the, the patients, it has to do with our democracy. 
Second, uh, need for participatory processes uh, during the design, drafting, implementation, and evaluation of public policy. Participation is not just one moment. I think it's through all the process uh, of making the law or the public policy, and also when we implement it. Third, uh, transparency, effectiveness, and relevance of the implemented initiatives and actions are desirable effects of participatory processes. It's not only the participation and the, and the law or the text or the activity or the decision. And uh, the legitimacy of decision-making by public institutions, very different decision that we uh, took with, we take with the patients and after a process of participation with patients or uh, civil society. So what we have done in, in our national cancer law is uh, work all together, various actors uh, collaborating, uh, you know, industry representatives, patient organizations, health professionals, scientific society, scholars, um, foundations and institutions of the health sector, and also representatives, uh, representatives of public inst institutions. Here I have um, the history of our can national cancer law and line time with the main milestone of the participatory process. First, we have uh, in 2012, uh, the creation of the National Cancer Forum. It's very important because this is a law that uh, grow bottom up, you can say. Uh, and it was a, a great friend, uh, Dr. Jorge Jimenez de la Jara, um, that he's uh, an ex-health uh, minister that uh, invite many people, different people, uh, to work in the basis of the National Council Law. And it was in November uh, 2014 when we entered the National Council Law Bill into the parliament. And uh, as Sara showed us, uh, is what very important, the pressure of uh, the uh, civil society and the patients uh, from allowing the law go forward in the parliament. That's why I put here the protest, the public protest for the National Council Law. Uh, that was the most important mobilization of the patients uh, that made uh, the president and the finance minister, most difficult signature of all, <laughs> uh, go, uh, support the law in the parliament. What we needed was um, the, the signature of the finance minister because we have public resources involved in the law and uh, we need for that the government. That was the most difficult thing. Um, and the patients, uh, the civil society was uh, the main clue for going forward with that. Then we uh, made a, um, a special uh, participative process in the detail of the law. Uh, the National Council Law is the first law in the Chilean parliament that uh, opens the participation to everybody uh, in a digital platform that we work with MIT and, and that allow people to make us proposal of the detail of the text of the law that were considered uh, in, the, in our work in the parliament. Uh, I said it, it was the first law in allowing it, this, uh, and then other laws uh, had made the same process. Uh, then uh, with the approval and official publication of the National Council Law uh, in September, September uh, 2020, we have uh, the process uh, also uh, participative, uh, process, a participative process to determine the contents of the operating regulations of the National Council Law. After that, the official publication of the operating regulations. And now we are in the election of the National Council Commission, uh, where we have uh, three representatives of the patient organizations, three representatives of the universities, and five representatives of the scientific societies. And this uh, commission has to uh, oversee, uh, have to evaluate the implementation of the National Council Plan. Here is a slide because uh, of the um, uh, financial protection of cancer in Chile, because 
we have uh, since uh, 2006 explicit health guarantees for some times, types of cancers. You can see here the list and we have been uh, including a new cancer in, in this uh, financial protection. And what we've done after that with our cancer law is um, to um, include there, there are other uh, kinds of cancer that are not in this list and also some uh, treatments that are not included. So we have in our cancer law a special financing for that. And also the plan that include uh, an strategic with um, specific activities uh, as you can see in, in, the, in the next slide. So the main elements of the national cancer law are this National Cancer Commission with the public participation and governance uh, that has to, um, to evaluate the National Cancer Plan and the implementation of the National Cancer Plan, the strategies, goals, and actors that are included in the plan. Uh, the plan must be evaluated uh, every five years. Uh, that was, that's, that, that's what uh, the, the law says. Uh, and we have the National Cancer Network, uh, that is the coordination of the health service provision, and the National Cancer Fund um, that allow us a public and private uh, collaboration. We have special benefits, special tax benefits for the um, um, companies or a person that wants to collaborate with a research in cancer or a build, building a a center of cancer or donate uh, uh, resources. The structure of the plan, the plan seeks to solve the problems associated with the, this disease with a comprehensive and integrated approach to the provision of health and social care for patients. In a context of collaboration between various actors, uh, the approach considers the following elements. Assessment of the patient's needs, and currently available resources, the creation of an institutional framework to support the plan, plans, uh, the identification of actions and initiatives, um, ensure sustainability, uh, monitor implementation of the plan, evaluation of the results and implementation of a governance mechanisms uh, based on public participation. And uh, here we have a summary of the strategic lines of the National uh, Cancer Plan that goes from promoting uh, an education and prevention to the governance. Uh, as you can see in promoting an education, we have uh, awareness uh, raising, healthy environments, uh, risk fast factors and protections, also health service provision with screening and diagnosis, treatments, palliative care, uh, rehabilitation, strengthening uh, of the oncological network, uh, infrastructure and equipment uh, and human capital also, and the registry information and monitoring. This is very important because in the law we made a uh, cancer as an uh, obligatory notification disease and this allowed us to uh, create the registry of cancer in Chile and the governance uh, regulation and inspections um, with the creation of the regulation and standards uh, for all the system, public and private system. I want to finish with this picture because uh, I think it shows very well uh, what was um, behind uh, the support of our cancer law. Uh, people, patients, uh, organization, uh, all the person that wants to, to save lives uh, and to work with cancer. And um, I think that the clue to make this policy, uh, the public policy continue um, and work uh, is uh, people, is uh, social, uh, civil society, sorry, um, because as me, I am authority today, I am a senator, but in four years, it uh, will be another senator. Uh, in four years in Chile, we change the president, the health minister, and which are the ones that continue are the patients. So the, the 
they are the ones that are always um, um, not as uh, the political people, you know, uh, and they must be in the table. They must work and be integrated in all the process uh, of making um, and implementing uh, a law as the cancer law, the national cancer law in Chile. Thank you very much. Carolina, um, thank you very, very much for your presentation. I mean, I am a little bit emotional after hearing you and after looking at, uh, I want you all to know that Carolina marched with us in the streets for many times. We were in the corners of the street, giving out pamphlets to the people. I mean, she's one of us and that's amazing. And Carolina, I really, from, from all the Chilean page, cancer patients, I want to thank you for the amazing job that you have worked and also, Thank you for sharing it here today. You, I know that you have a very terrible agenda, and but and thank you very very much for sharing with us uh, this time. Thank you. I, I just want to chime in as well because I have heard this story over the years, and it is absolutely incredible to hear what you have achieved together in Chile. Just wasn't even recognized as a disease. And because of this effort, the synergy uh, with the Senator, with PIGA, with all the patient associations just became a recognized disease. Just high cost treatments became on the list to be reviewed for reimbursement. I mean, I want everybody in this meeting today to know that if you don't think this is attainable to create a cancer law, look what was achieved in Chile. It is absolutely incredible. And it really takes a collaborative effort that was shared today. And I, I hope that you can really reflect on that in your own countries. Thank you. Thank, Thank you, you Sara. Okay, after this emotional, <laughs> um, I would like to, well, thank, again, Carolina, thank you very much. I know that you, you have a lot of things to do. If, if you can have to leave, please uh, go ahead. And if you can stay, it would be great. Also, if you can stay up till the end for if they have some questions for you. So, and uh, our next uh, guest is uh, um, from Kenya. It's Florence and Elo, and uh, um, their fighting for drug access has no boundaries. And you you can do what any amazing things that you can imagine. So I won't say any anything else. I just would like to uh, Florence and Elo share share with us their great and very special initiative they, they made in, in Kenya. So there, the audience for you, Florence. Thank you, Piga. Hello, everyone. I'm happy to have this opportunity. Kindly let me share my screen. Do you need help putting it in presentation mode? Uh, yes, I think yes. I'm getting back. Okay, good. Okay. My name is Florence, as uh, Figa has introduced me, and I work with Hands of Kenya, an advocacy uh, patient support group. So I'm just going to go through briefly on what we do as uh, pertains to ac better access to medication. Uh, and uh, we are made of CML and GIST patients and we are about 300 GISTers. Our key mission being awareness, support and advocacy. We hold regular meetings in clinic setups and do webinars and professional continuing medical education for healthcare professional. And how we started, uh, like most of uh, 
what I've heard about uh, other organizations, Grivec was the only available drug. Uh, we usually get a grant from Max Foundation. And uh, the patients could only get their medication from one centralized place, uh, Nairobi Capital Center. So it meant uh, patients would come from far from areas to get their medication. And imagine some would take six days and a cost of a, almost 100, uh, 100 US dollars to come and get their free medication. And there was a lot of low awareness, especially among health, healthcare workers. And we didn't have any support from our national hospital insurance. The progress we've made uh, is that now, at least we have the second line students available and we have uh, decentralized the clinics. Uh, at least we have five more centers where the patients can go and get their medication, reducing the travel time and cost for, for coming to pick their medication. And we have sustained improvement in awareness, especially through flyers and direct engagement during continual medical education sessions. I would like to thank uh, LifeRaft because uh, that is part of our, we are sharing with our patients as far as awareness is concerned, information on LifeRaft. And the National Hospital Insurance Fund now covers some elements of this treatment, surgery and hospital pay. That is through our advocacy. Before they never used to pay for surgery, for scans, at least they can pay for one surgery, a, a small percentage, and uh, scans they pay for one per year. So the rest has to be footed by the patient. And hospitals pay, they also pay a small fee. Uh, and uh, how would success look for us? Uh, we have only two medications, the Grivec and Sutent. We don't have the deadline. So if uh, we have more medication being made available to us, it will be a plus for us. Uh, we still need more administration centers to reduce travel time and cost for our patients uh, and create a central point of information for GIST. Most of our patients are not um, internet survey. So we are still trying to see how we can do pictorials so that they can understand better their journey. And our National Hospital Insurance Fund uh, has developed a comprehensive care pack for these patients. And there has been a recent legislative change provided for wider resources who to enable such development. And uh, we are still feeling our medical fraternity to embrace mutational testing. Uh, and key success uh, factors, uh, it's through partnerships. We are in partnership with other cancer organizations in the country so that we can have a bigger voice when we forward our issues to the relevant authorities and uh, other cancer advocates. And uh, pharmaceuticals, we are very close with Novartis, the manufacturers of Divec, the donor agencies, and research bodies. Uh, we have uh, information sharing among patients and hair care professionals and public, and resource mobilization for awareness, support, and advocacy. Uh, our challenges, as far as our better access is concerned, we have uh, limited resources for patients monitoring and follow ups. As much as the medication is uh, free for us, uh, we are given as a grant, patients have challenges uh, with the cost of monitoring and follow-ups. So you find a patient may miss their drugs because they've not had their scan or they've not had their, their blood works because they cannot afford the medication, which is quite unfortunate. Uh, most of the times we've had, we usually have a WhatsApp group, and if a patient is uh, 
hard pressed for money, they ask for donations from the other patients and they, we support one another. Uh, we have government bureaucracies, delays, policy implement, implementation and drugs delivery. I'll give a scenario on, on that. And the issue of only having one uh, first and second line. So people with advanced yeast and unresponsive mutations, they don't have any alternative uh, drug. And with no mutation or testing, of course, is like what you do here is try and error. We use Glivec if it does not work. We use a student, not asking whether we need to use those drugs at all. So it's, it's a challenge to us. Okay, now uh, I'd like to share a scenario of a government bureaucracy that happened last year in the height of a pandemic. Uh, we, we could not get our drugs because of a government bureaucracy. And uh, I just want to demonstrate that sometimes we have to do what we have to do to get what we want because we need to be here. So it was such a time when a few of us patients had a sitting campaign at our ministry offices. And we are hoping to see and talk to one of the highest ranking officer because our drugs were being held. They were, they were in the country, but they could not be released. They could be released because we could hear this letter is in this office. It has not been signed. So and so has not been in the office. The letter has not been signed. And patients were going without drugs. And in the middle of the pandemic, you can imagine the panic that we had. So we were there, a few of our, a few of us patients, we were at the offices at 5.30 a.m. in the morning. And uh, there was no one, but we informed that the minister comes very early in the morning and leaves. And he wanted to get the minister before he goes away. We didn't have an appointment because we knew making an appointment, we'd be told, oh, the minister is busy. We cannot give you an appointment. So we had to go there early at 5.30 and we sat at the reception. Three hours later at 8.30, the other staff were streaming in, coming to their offices. They were looking at us and wondering, what, what are these people here for this time? And one around that were patients waiting for the minister. And everybody was concerned, even the guards were really concerned. In fact, that particular day, everybody who was coming in or coming to, was coming to us and asking, what are you waiting for? Because how can you come in the office at seven if there are people who are already there before you? So six hours after, we were ushered in into the PA's office. After six hours, we sat there patiently. We did not complain. We just waited. So we were ushered in. And we were able to give her our grievances. We explained to her what it meant as patients to miss the drugs or skip the drugs and the panic it was causing to the patients. And actually we even explained to her that some people are panicking and feeling like now their end had come. So in this scenario, I would want to just share what worked for us. Our resilience and patience finally caught the attention of the minister and our efforts were rewarded by having our processes fast tracked and we were able to get the drugs on time. Seeing patients ourselves, putting faces to numbers, there was empathy. And uh, whoever was sleeping on their jobs got moving and we got our medication on time. So that is one of the things we've seen. Sometimes you have to go out of your way to get things done. Even if it means sleeping in those offices, you just must have to let it uh, do whatever it takes. And about the having other centers for patients to receive their drugs, we also had to advocate for other hospitals to agree. Our oncologists, usually uh, the consultation is free, they do it pro bono. So we had to advocate for our patients to have oncologists that will not charge them in other parts of the country 
where we are going to have the medication administered. So far, that's what we've been doing. Uh, yes. <laughs> Asante Nisan. Asante means thank you very much. Thank you very much to you, you, Florence. Uh, well, as, as we can see, there, no, there are no rules when you have to fight for access for a drug. And I mean, you have to do whatever you, you want to achieve the, the final goal. And is and as, as, uh, as we talked with Sarah, is putting a face to the problem as they did. Uh, as we did, we were in the streets, I mean, fighting for our rights and, and you did the same. So great, congratulations. It's uh, amazing. Thank you very much for sharing it with us. And uh, our last guest in this session is Tania Diaz. She's from Colombia, from Fundación Retorno Vital. Uh, she has a great initiative to, to show us. And I'm sure that many of us will, will try to do something like that in our country. So uh, I'll leave her, leave her with you. And uh, I'm sure we all have many, we'll have many questions later. So Tania, go ahead, please. Thank you so much. Can you hear me well? Yes, perfect. Perfect. So I'm going to share my screen so you can see my slides. My name is Tania. I'm 24 years old. I am currently rep representation Fundación Retorno Vital. It means vital return. It doesn't sound as poetic in English as it does in Spanish. So I'm just gonna tell you what we're doing right now. Who are we? We're a nonprofit organization fundated on 2006 by a patient with kidney transplant. At the beginning, we only work with people with that kind of conditions, but right now we are working with people with any kind of medical condition with chronic and high cost diseases. We have impact on a national level, but also we're currently working with different umbrella organizations with an international uh, kind of impact. So in Colombia, we have a, a big challenge for access. Uh, patients do not have access to our health system. It's really complicated for them to have uh, their drugs, their, their treatments and their appointments with doctors on time. So this kind of delays impact their lives. We have some numbers that, that help us to understand the big picture. The National Superintendent of Health said that on 2020, people reported more than 850,000 petition complaints and requests on information because they didn't have access to health system. And also the People's Defenders say that on 2019, more than 207,000 uh, 207, people claim because they they saw their right, their health and social security right violated. So they had to raise their voice and, and look for the body control to help them to have access. Also, we have our own data. We created the platform swap. It means we are a patient support. Somos un apoyo al paciente on 2018 and since then we have been um, supporting people to overcome access barriers to our system and we have more than four four thousand people in our in our information system in our database which has been helped by us by our our patients to overcome this kind of access barriers so we saw there was a problem and what are we doing to, to solve that problem, to help people to overcome this kind of access barriers? We offer them personalized guidance and support in every single step they have to make to, since the diagnosis until they have their treatments. We have to build a strategic alliance with uh, all the actors in our system. We have to build a networking to improve um, or maybe to work together to find better solutions and sustainable solutions for the struggling of the patients. We're also working on, on improve the therapeutic adherence by helping people to have therapeutic on time and to have their appointments on time and to have everything they need on time. We also impact on public policies with our data, as you will see later. We also identify problems with identify risk before it 
um, before it even happens because if you know the system if you know how it works and if you talk with the patients all the time every day you will be able to know what's going on in the system what's going wrong in the system what is not working and you will have you will be capable to raise awareness but not only about self-care but also about um, raising awareness for companies, insurance companies, or provider services to better practice how to make the system more efficient for patients. And with that, we have built a whole national support network with body controls, with the minister, with other organizations, with patients to empower the patients so they can know how the system works and how we can do this because it's, it's really difficult, but how, we, how do we do this? We need to know the problem from the patient perspective. This is very important because we usually look for solutions from the insurance perspective, but not from the patient perspective. We have to be part of the process. We have to raise the voice of those who have not been listened. We have to build evidence. We have to build data. Data is so important right now. And we have to report that evidence directly to all the health system actors. As you saw before, we, we are working currently with ministers, contract bodies, with insurance companies, with the legislators, with health care providers. And we have to monitor what we're doing with all these actors. Now we have, to, we have to make improvement plans. We have to look for sustainable solutions. It's really important for us to know every single step in the uh, healthcare system, what a patient has to do since the diagnosis until they have the, the treatments uh, on time. And with that patient perspective, we can build solutions to structural challenges, because if we have stru structural challenges, we have to look for structural, structural solutions too. Our users, as you can see, we're not focused only on cancer patients. We're working with any kind of chronic and high cost heal conditions. It includes uh, cancer, immunological condition, or rare conditions. But our, our services are available for any user of our system with any kind of access barriers, even if they're, I don't know, a, a pregnant woman or, or a children with mental health, any kind of user can, can use us as services. This is um, just a brief look of our results. I'm sorry because our infographies are only available in Spanish by now. But what is important here is that we are building data. We are building, we are identifying what is going on in the system. Just on the first semester or of 2020, we helped more than 600 people to overcome access barriers without any legal process. We help them by, by, by just building a, a whole networking with the whole system when we all can work to find the better solutions without having to change the policies or we having, without having to uh, use any legal resources for patients, but working together to really improve the system. And we are capable of identifying what's going on, what's wrong, because we know where, where, when and where are happening delays for bureaucratic process, for um, maybe un, un, not connected, system of information between the insurance, the, pharma the pharmaceutical, or the um, provider services. When there are delays for uh, making a schedule for a patient with his, his doctor, and we're also working with data in all the country. So we know what's going on in all the regions with all the patients, no matter what their conditions or medical conditions is. And we're also working with a lot of women because more than 60% of our population are women. So we need to have a gender focus. And why is data so important right now? What to do with that evidence? We need to converse, we need to dialogue with public policy makers. We have seen what Chile made when they have the opportunity to talk with the streets, to talk with the people, and when they when they say they had a needed, we have that evidence when something's wrong. So we definitely have the opportunity to talk with public policymakers to make an impact, to make a change when it's necessary. We need to identify the risk before it can materialize. If we know that something's wrong in the system, something's not working, we have to identify it and we have to report that. So the, the decision makers can make a change uh, on time. 
and we need to with that data with that evidence we can uh, build bilateral and multilateral partnerships with all the health system actors because we are not overreacting we are not against them we're working with them we're trying to let make them see what's wrong from a patient's perspective and we can talk we can dialogue we can make a conversation a better conversation if we talk with evidence and what's more important is that evidence needs to be available for everyone because this is an information that's going to work for patients and not patients for people like me for young people who maybe doesn't have a, a diagnosis right now but uh, it's interesting on on is interested on knowing what's going on in the system what's going on with the with the mental health what's going on with public health and i'm just going to leave you with a uh, little reflection about why I think it's the current challenges for advocacy. I think there's a lack of diversity on those spaces where decisions are made. We definitely need more female leaders. We need more, we need to listen our ethnic communities. We need to know what they think about wellness, what, they, what, what is their idea of wellness and development. Because if we open up the conversation, there's still a lot we can learn about public health and what we can improve to be better for patients, no matter what their ethnic condition or their, their, their health condition is. And we also, as leaders, have to see the whole picture, no? We need to see the whole picture. We live in a global crisis, economical, political, and, and also sanitary. And in Latin America, uh, in Latin America, we're living a um, democratic crisis, which is leading us to a lack of trust on institutions. So we're gonna, in future, we're gonna have to work on building and rebuilding the relationship between the patient and the whole system because they don't trust on, on institutions. And that's a challenge for us because we, we're trying to work in together and sometimes they see us as a part of the system. So maybe they can trust on us because we are an institution between the system. But uh, as a social movement, we have the opportunity to talk with all kinds of person, with all kinds of patients. And if we open up the conversation and open up for diversity, maybe we can have a, a better exercise of advocacy. So thank you so much. This is what we're doing from Colombia and I hope you can visit us. Thank you very much, Tanya. It's incredible. It's an amazing initiative. And I hope we all could have something that first patients working for patients. I think it's great. And again, the, the you mentioned the importance of having the patient in the center and in the all, all the process. We heard that before from Senator Goich also. And the another thing, the importance of data, which is right, it's it's the main thing here to, to have uh, evidence for what we are fighting for. Well, I think that the four the four presentations have been really great. I don't know if we have well, there are questions for now. For Senator had Gorge had to leave. She just texted me that she had to leave, but I would try to answer in her behalf so if I can. If not, I can answer later. And so let's open to whatever questions. Um, If anyone has to, wants to raise her hand, and Sarah, can you help me with that? Because I don't see any questions for them in the chat. Yeah. Oh, Norman, Norman's clapping, or do you have a question? I have a statement. You know, uh, you try to figure out how, how it is that a group of patients and a group of doctors can get together today from India from Canada, from Kenya, from Chile. You're gonna, you'll help me out, sir, because I'm obviously gonna forget somebody. From Australia, from Colombia, uh, from uh, what, 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 who do South I Korea. Today? Pardon? South Korea. Korea. And from South Korea. And, 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 and what, what do we have in common? What we have in common is that we are humanity. And we are determined, no matter where we live in this world, that an individual can make a difference, whether you're sitting at a desk in, in, in Africa or whether you're sitting at a, at a farm in, in, uh, 
in Australia, wherever you happen to be, that, that, that the, the power of an individual to bring about change is extraordinary. And 20 years ago, uh, when I was sitting in a waiting room, uh, my wife was one of the first, the first patients on, just patients on Gleevec. And the radiologist came, and my wife was, had been dying before this. She had metastatic disease. She had gone through, through nine surgeries and she had chemotherapy and radiation, everything you could think of. And there we sit and a radiologist comes running into the room and her slides are up in the wall. And he says, Norman, I've never seen anything like this in my life. Half her tumors are gone and the rest are dissolving into liquid. And what I remember saying to I said, that's a good story. We ought to share it. I had no idea what the word sharing meant. And every year when we get together like this, it, 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 takes, on, uh, it takes on a whole new meaning. So I want to thank each of you uh, in, in every country, in every place in the world. Uh, and there are 25 nations participating in, uh, uh, in this particular uh, uh, event uh, this week. You know, God bless you. I mean, give yourself a pat on the shoulder and a gigantic hug in, in terms of what you are doing and what you're accomplishing. And, and finally, I would say that there, there is a clause in, the, uh, uh, in, uh, in, in Hebrew that says that he who saves one life, one life is as if he has saved the entire world. And think of how many lives together each of you have saved. Uh, so God bless you. And Sarah, thanks for letting me talk for a minute. Thank you, Norman, for your work. Okay, so we're, we've been talking up until now about the access problems and different solutions from, from every country. So uh, if, if there are, I think that there are no questions for the, for the, this, the our last guest, are they? No, I don't see. Well, then we can move to the next session is that we're going to um, discuss about uh, other problems in other parts of the world and different initiatives. I think maybe Pat from the life uh, from, oh, sorry. Uh, from, uh, I don't think, I don't think Pat from the Max Foundation is Mention here. Is not there, here. There's other people there. I think there's Andy or Meeching. I don't know if anybody else wants to contribute in terms of what they've done in terms of global access, but there's others on the line as well that we really want to make this a, a personalized experience. So feel free to share your, share your video, unmute yourself and, 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 and contribute to the discussion about what you've seen as some of the issues in your countries or, or some, some, some ideas. Um, or, mm -hmm. yeah. Pete? All right, yeah, I just want to make it more of a comment than anything else. And it's been said in the chat, but events like this, where we highlight these things are important for a lot of reasons. Yes, obviously, we get to see what other countries and groups are doing. But it's beyond these these walls, okay, that we do that, because there are a lot of there, I guarantee, I don't know who it is, but there's a country out there right now, where there's an advocate like yourself, who's sitting here and going, this really can't be done. But then they look and they see, well, it was done in Chile, it was done in Colombia, it was done in all these, it's being done in Kenya, it's being done in all these other places. So just the existence of this, and, you know, this will be recorded and we'll go out and, and you know, people will see these videos, ha you're going to have an echo effect, you know, it's like a, when you throw the pebble in a pond and it, and it ripples, what's going to happen is someone is going to, is going to see this and say, well, wait a second, if they did it, I can do it. And, and that's what's really important is we can sit here and, and mince, you know, words about, well, is this effort better or, or what would this work in our country or whatever, but just doing anything at this point. I mean, it, what's, what's striking to me is all these different countries, yet it's, as Norman kind of alluded to, it's really the same problem in different places. You may, it may take a, a different variation of the solution, but it's actually not that different. A lot of what it is, when you talk, Piga said it, you know, and uh, Tanya, you're saying it's getting out there on the street. It's getting out there and actually doing it instead of talking about it. So just doing that and getting this out here, just realize 
we'll be sitting here next year or the year after in another New Horizons talking about some other group that did something. And don't be surprised when they say, yeah, I, I saw that presentation from that senator from Chile, or I saw that presentation from that young lady from Colombia, or something like that. And that's going to be what inspires them to do this. So yeah, you know, pat yourself on the back, but also it, pay it forward. If somebody asks you, reaches out to you and says, how could I do this? Just answer that email or that phone call, because uh, you'll be surprised the effect, the, out, the large effect you can have with what you did. Thanks, Steve. You know, and, and the other thing I would like to mention is how we can change things, how all these great uh, initiatives come from, what is the origin? I mean, it's, it's, being, it's a disease, it's being sick, it's having a problem. How you can change that from something so, so stressful and so, I mean, you can turn it into something positive. And I think that that's the amazing thing that has been shared here, you know, that all of us have turned kind of breaking the, 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 the pain or whatever, turning it into something positive. And I think that that's amazing, really. So thank you, all of them, for sharing the, the experiences. David, Giuseppe, are you available? Are you on the line? Because I know that what's going on in Canada <clears throat> is what, um, what, went, what happened in Australia. Yes, and I'm here. Hello. And, and, I, and I'm wondering, David, if maybe there's some questions that you might have for Sarah with what they've done in Australia that you can find ways to emulate in Canada as you pull your testimonials together to submit to, for reimbursement for Repertinib. Funny you should mention that. I've already been uh, messaging Sarah during oh. our discussion. In fact, I was just doing that. Well, um, open it in, up to in, the floor. We want to learn. Yeah. Well, I mean, I'm interested that uh, you, that they went ahead so quickly in uh, Australia that you are have already gone through a second round. Um, we have a somewhat comparable process in Canada that goes to an agency with the name of CADAF, Canadian Agency on Drugs, Technology and Health, something like that. And they are now reviewing the uh, Quinlock application as we speak. In fact, we have, well, we, we are preparing right now our submission to CADAF, which will be comparable, I guess. I hope it'll be as good as uh, what Sarah has accomplished in Australia. But it, this is the first round for us. And in fact, we found that there was a very long delay on the part, I think, of the manufacturer uh, before they uh, went ahead with uh, applying for approval. I don't know why that happened. It's, it's always quite opaque, quite difficult to see what's going, impossible to see what's going on in the drug companies as they get ready for these submissions. But uh, anyway, they decided to go ahead in, uh, I guess, September. And now we're on a short deadline to, pre to prepare our submission to CADETH, which I think is roughly comparable to what you did in Australia. So that's where we are, and I hope we can do as well. Oh, well, absolutely. I um, actually heard through the Australian uh, GIST uh, group that, that you're going through that same process at the moment. Um, so yeah, absolutely. It's, it's such a difficult, um, it's, I found it quite difficult just to know the sequence of events and um, the roles of the, the different people involved. Um, I think usually in Australia, it takes a, um, a few years from if, if one application is declined, there's a few years before the resubmission goes in. I think there is a new early submission program, which is why it came back so quickly. Um, and which is also part of the reason we didn't have a huge amount of time to prepare for that uh, second meeting. Um, but, you know, I, I guess it's amazing what can be done with a, with a um, short deadline. Everyone knew that it was urgent and um, worked through the night and a few nights to be able to pull everything together. So, um, you know, the, I guess the government sets these timelines and as patients, we just do what we need to do. And, um, you know, I, I, I um, hope that uh, you, it becomes um, successful successful in, in Canada and then I believe you've got quite a few submissions that have come through is that right 
David yes, uh, we have a professional person uh, working full time on the application right now, and I ha understand she has a lot of good feedback from patients already. One thing I would point out, I mean, in terms of the global community, I've been reflecting on this for many years now that people like Sarah and myself, we're, we're put in a very odd position by the governments with regard to this process. Because after all, Sarah and I and every, I mean, and everyone else on this call, uh, we're doing our very best, but we have no mandate. We have no formal mandate. We're not elected. We're not appointed. No just patient has elected or appointed. Well, I mean, our members have elected me as president of our group, but but I have, in other words, I have no real democratic mandate to speak on behalf of the just patients in Canada. We're just volunteers, right? We're just volunteers. But we're put in this very odd and almost conflicted position by the government that the government really points its finger at us and say, you, Sarah, or you, David, you're appointed to speak for the patients. And, and at least in Canada, they only allow one patient submission for a drug. It's only wow. one. So wow. if the finger points at you and says you're doing it, you're doing it. And that means, for example, that to put a fine point on it, that if another just patient in Canada says, hey, Life Life Group Canada, they're okay, but they don't speak for me. I want to make my own submission to Canada. I want to state my case. They're not allowed to. They're not allowed to. The finger is pointed at me, even though they never, they never, you know, they never released uh, their right to, to intervene directly. So it's a very odd position. And I'm just saying, you know, on behalf to, to Sarah, that it takes real courage to take this on because if we, if we mess up and get a negative decision, the, can the patients hold us responsible for not doing a good job? I don't know. I, we're really into uncharted territory. The governments want patients to have input, but I'm very conflicted as to the as to the legitimacy, if you will, of the of the mandate that we're handed to do it. Pete, you may have a comment on that. I'm pointing at the comments right down here. Tanya just just hit the nail on the head. Okay. Yep, that's a policy. That's not a law. Only one policy. person can speak. Change it. it. It's nonsense. Just change it. And how do you change it? By electing officials who are interested in changing it. That's how you do it. So that, that's exactly it. If it's really, to think that only one person can speak for an entire nation, on it, that's, that's ludicrous, completely ludicrous. And you're absolutely right, Tanya. It's the diversity issue. We need to hear. Now, the tricky part is also the second part of what David said. And we've all experienced this, okay? You know, why is it that way? Norman's going to say tradition, you know, and that's exactly what it is. But they want us in the room, right? Or do they? They want us they in the want room, us but when we start room. talking, that's the issue. They want us in the room, but, the, but they reserve the right to tell us who goes into the room. And, and they, it's not uh, legitimate. The yeah. Really not. Ultimately, it's not legitimate. They want to make life easy. The bureaucrats want to make life easy for themselves. They just want to read one document. Whether they even read that one document, we sometimes wonder. So it really, I agree, it needs to be changed. Yeah, yeah. I, I think one of, this is one of the great achievements of this law we, we have now in Chile, that it indicates that there has been a commission in the health ministry where three representatives of patients should be sitting in, just side by side with the academia and with the, and the, with the Social uh, societies. I that's what I think. And there we and there we have a vote, voice and vote. So I hope that it will be work. And because that that's will will be then they will need to hear us because we will be we will be sitting in the same table where they are. So let's hope it works. Sarah and then Jane. So I think from um, in in my experience as well. I um. Um, I've, I guess I just uh, stood up as and tried to bring as many people with me as possible. I um, sort of uh, wasn't the only person to put in it. We could put in as many patient submissions as possible. The representative in the committee, which I'm not sure who they were, um, but there were consumer reps in the committee. Um, I, so I think um, as, a, as a patient advocate, I knew that I couldn't personally carry the load myself. I knew that <laughs> I would buckle pretty fast. Yeah. So for me, it was just a matter of um, uh, just trying to um, 
uh, I guess, educate and um, inform as many people as I could to try and inspire them to step up with me and just to form a, a large group and unite to then achieve whatever we could, um, not only for this moment, but for all future moments as well. Um, so um, th that was sort of the approach. I, I, I in no way even pretend that I represent the group. I just feel like I'm just one who's trying to, to, to bring a large group together. Um, but I can imagine that would be very difficult, David, for you just to be, if you're nominated representative, then it's very difficult. We all have different experiences. We all have different variations of the disease. It's it, one person should not carry that at all. That's um, a lot. And of course, to be clear, we're bringing in the input of many patients, but our group is the one that's handing in the, the document in mm. the end. And as I say, we have no official mandate to do that. So, and the, the other point I might make, I think we all understand it's the elephant in the room that uh, putting this submission together to CADA is a huge job. It's going to require at least a month of full-time professional work. Our group does not have the resources to fund that kind of document, well, mm -hmm. preparation of that document. We can only do it by getting a grant from a company. And I will let you guess as to which company might be behind giving us that grant. And so it's how, how the system works. Mm -hmm. And so it is in a way an inherent conflict of interest. It's a very strange situation, but we have no alternative but to work through that. There's no way that we have one that one of our volunteers is working full time and caring for their loved one patient uh, can possibly take on the huge professional task of preparing one of these dossiers. It's just not possible. Shane. And unmute yourself, please. Hi there. Hi, Jane. Um, I'm just uh, interested because obviously I've, I've been in, in the UK, obviously, uh, in England, we have the NICE process for drugs approval. And um, I've been involved in quite a few of those. But there are, there are some things I suppose I've noted along the way. When I first started, I was a novice. I think I've got more experience in how these things work in our country now. To begin with, one of the things that was quite noticeable is that sometimes we didn't receive an invitation because the body that, that reviews drugs, I suppose they weren't experts in all the different um, advocacy groups that might exist for a particular disease. So sometimes um, they would be sending out invitations to inappropriate groups. So you uh -huh. kind of do need to make sure you're on, on their list, if you see what I mean, on their radar, I, I would suggest. Um, obviously, after we kicked up a bit of a fuss, we, we're on the list now. <laughs> so that was the first thing. But the, the second thing was um, they, they have made really big strides to include patients. And that actually includes patients in addition to patient advocates who are representing the overall voice of um, the patient group. And I, I think the advice, David, that you've just been given to change the system, I think you, put, you, could, all, you could probably even start to do that with your submission for this uh, next appraisal of the drug. Um, because, you know, having examples of pa real life patient stories that you can quote in your, in your proposal about why the drug is going to be the most benefit is the start of the whole process. Currently with... Um, the, the appraisal process we have here, you, you are asked to nominate yourself as a patient expert, but also um, nominate other patient experts. And then they, they select from the range of people that you submit. Um, and to, well, in more recent times, the appraisals have usually consisted of um, a representative from our group, a representative from say Sarcoma UK, giving the overall patient perspective, but then also two patients who are either on the drug, have been on the trial or whatever. And um, it's a really strong um, delivery in, in that sort of review panel room when, I mean, there are some uncomfortable parts to that, you know, when they're asking about life expectancy when taking the drug, et cetera. But, um, you know, it, it is the only way to get a balanced picture, I think, to have patients actually there talking about their first-hand experience of using that drug. Anyway. I understand that the UK, and I think particularly particularly Scotland, is in the forefront of, uh, of, of this, and we're yeah. behind. Yeah. 
I'll, I'll just say that kind of makes the point. Thank you, Jane. But so first off, we've learned different countries do it differently. Shocking. We've also learned bureaucracies tend to be fairly bureaucratic. Again, shocking. So but now the question becomes, OK, so I'm hearing from Jane that the process isn't perfect because sometimes they invite the wrong people or don't invite the people. OK, I'm hearing from David that that process is not designed for a patient to navigate it by themselves. No one should be expected to put together a professional dossier in a fairly short period of time. I, Sarah, how you did that in 10 days, I don't want to know, probably a time warp was involved, but you know, again, you should never have been put in that position in the first place. So what should be happening is feedback needs to go to these bureaucracies saying, listen, this just is not a, a good system. One of two things is going to happen. Either they are going to say, you know, you're actually right and we will change the system. That's the positive, that's the carrot part. And there's the stick. If they say, well, we don't care because ultimately what you find out is their job is really to just push the pebble along, then you vote with your ballot is how it works, okay? And then you take care of it that way and find folks who are willing to change and change the process from without as opposed to within. But either way, what I'm hearing here is these systems are fractured and need to change. And that's great to tell me and Sarah and Norman that, but you got to tell those legislators that and make sure and see how they respond. And uh, so you, you now, David, have a, um, a best in breed that you can refer to. You can say, well, this is not the way it's done in Chile. This is not the way it's done in the UK. This is not the way it's done in Australia. And sometimes shame actually is very effective. So we'll see how that works. But I'm interested to hear in the next year or so how successful you guys were by going after those bureaucrats. Especially you, just said because I know what you can do. <laughs> I want to Thank chime you. in one more one more time. Can you hear me? Um, yes. You know, I've given uh, lots of talks over the years, and and uh, one time for a pharmaceutical company, and one time for for uh, uh, a group of of uh, of government representatives, and I was usually on a panel with a group of patient representatives. And every period, every once in a while, what I've done is to say to the group is, I want to take one out and divide the group differently. Instead of dividing it between all your pharmaceutical executives and all the patient reps or your government bureaucrats and patient reps and what have you, I would like to divide the room between those who, whose families have been affected by cancer and those whose families have not. And we actually did it in a couple of occasions. And when we looked at, when we looked at, at, at the room after it resorted itself, every single person was standing on the side of the room whose family had been affected by cancer. And I think that there is there there is a thread there that we need to uh, uh, that we need to to think about sometimes in a positive way. Uh, doesn't matter whether you are a senator or whether you're you're an executive or what have you. Almost everybody is affected by cancer, and we need to start talking to each other. It's becoming a little more difficult now. The world is becoming more divisive. But talking to each other as, you know, as as patients and as caregivers, uh, and reaching out to people in uh, in uh, in that way. I want to say one more thing. Piga, Piga is our secret weapon in terms of the global activities of the Life Raft Group. Okay. Sits quietly in Santiago, Chile, and changes laws and reaches out all over the world. And I want you to know, Pika, that we are sending you a tremendous hug today through this pandemic and uh, and through this virtual meeting. Thank you for what you do, Pika. Thank you, Norma. Thank you very much. I think at this point, um, we're going to conclude the meeting for today. I want to thank all the panelists and presenters. I, I hope you are all inspired. I know I was, um, and I'm glad that this was recorded so it can live on and inspire others because we, we need to share this with the entire community and actually beyond just. Um, so thank you all for participating today.